Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and my goal is to help you to either teach or study the scriptures with more relevancy and power. This week, we're going to be covering 1 Corinthians chapters 14 through 16. So if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. And wow, only three chapters to cover this week. So my video is actually going to be a little bit shorter for once. But there are some big ideas here. Personally, I would spend the bulk of my time in chapter 15. But I'll also give you just a few brief additional thoughts from chapters 14 and 16 as well. But chapter 15 is where we're going to begin today. For an icebreaker, you could play the what's missing game. And the way you do this is you display a slide with a bunch of random pictures on it like this, and then tell your class that you've got 30 seconds to study it. But then after the 30 seconds, you're going to show them another picture with all of the objects mixed up, and one of them is going to be missing. So their job is going to, to be to identify which picture it is that's missing. Depending on the age of your class, you could do a more difficult one, like this. Or you could do an easier one, like this. And, and were you able to identify the missing picture? Well, with that, do you remember how we said that Corinthians was a book of problems? Well, Paul saved one of the biggest and most serious ones for last. The Corinthians also have a doctrinal problem. Their faith is missing a key truth. As they're doubting, they're denying one of the core doctrines of the gospel. And that's my question for you. Which doctrine is missing from their faith, according to verse 12? Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So what doctrine's missing? The doctrine of resurrection. And I don't know about you, but my reaction to that is, is really? Of all the doctrines of Christianity that you're going to deny, the resurrection is the one that you choose? That, that's one of the, the beliefs that makes us Christian. It's the greatest miracle that Christ ever performed. You take away the doctrine of resurrection and the whole rest of our faith and, and our grasp of the plan of salvation kind of crumbles. And I think that their problem is that they really haven't thought it through. They haven't followed that line of reasoning to its logical conclusion or made the connection between that doctrine and everything else that we believe and do. And that does beg the question, why would they deny the resurrection? What's the draw? What's the motivation for denying that particular doctrine? Verses 32 through 33 may contain a hint. Paul says, If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. So, if you deny the resurrection, that means that there's no afterlife. That, that this life is all there is. And if this life is all there is, and there's no judgment or repercussions to our decisions here on earth, then what becomes the most tempting philosophy on how to live your life? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's what Paul says here. And we're not totally sure what incident he's referring to when he says that he's fought with beasts at Ephesus. That could be figurative language, meaning he faced a lot of opposition to the people of Ephesus, which we read about back in Acts chapter 19. Or perhaps there's some story from Paul's life that we're not aware of, and, and he did face wild beasts there. But his point is, what good is all the opposition and challenge that I've faced to, to teach the gospel if there's no resurrection after this life? I might as well just 
give all that up and seek a life of ease and pleasure. And remember that Corinth is a very hedonistic society. A live for the moment, do what feels good today and let tomorrow take care of itself kind of society. And I really like Paul's conclusion about this in verse 33. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Or in other words, bad doctrine can lead to bad behavior. And that's a fascinating statement. I think that helps us to understand why Satan attacks our doctrine so fiercely. If you can destroy an understanding of the doctrines of the gospel then a person's behavior is likely to follow. I, I think it's interesting that the enemies of the church don't usually spend a lot of time criticizing our behaviors as members of the church. I mean, it's kind of hard to criticize a, a devotion to family, service, honesty, and hard work. So they don't really go after those things. Instead, they attack our doctrine our belief in priesthood, the way we see the Godhead, man's divine potential, the restoration, our understanding of the plan of salvation. And if you can get somebody to doubt or deny the doctrines of the church, then that foundation crumbles and everything else, such as a commitment to commandments and standards, can begin to crumble as well. Evil communication corrupts good manners. And perhaps you've seen that in somebody. As soon as a person loses their doctrinal footing in the church, it's amazing how quickly their behavior can change too. So, so if we can keep our doctrinal foundation firm, we are much less likely to be deceived. And that's what Paul's going to do. Paul's going to try and shore up their faith in the resurrection to keep that from happening. Therefore, he's going to take the entire chapter all 58 verses of 1 Corinthians 15 to defend the doctrine of resurrection. He's just going to hammer away at that, giving them reason after reason for why it just doesn't make sense to deny that doctrine. So I found that a good way to approach this chapter is to invite my students to begin with this resurrection true-false handout first. And not only will it help you to cover the major principles of resurrection, but it also helps give a nice framework to the lesson and, and maintains interest. So give them a couple of minutes to go through and answer all the questions based on what they know now about the resurrection. And then we're going to let Paul correct our answers. We'll take each statement and, and then, as a teacher, go question by question pointing them to the specific verses that I highlight here to correct their answers. So here we go. Statement number one. The only witnesses of the resurrected Jesus that we know of are Mary Magdalene, the original 12 apostles, and Joseph Smith. Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8 to answer that question. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. So what's our answer? False. And this one is really false. There are so many more witnesses of the resurrected Christ. According to 1 Corinthians 15, we can add more than 500 brethren at once to our list, and Paul. But is that even it? You could ask your students if there's anybody else that we could add. Well, the other women at the tomb, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, 
2,500 Nephites at Bountiful, the Lost Tribes of Israel, Mormon, Moroni, Sidney Rigdon, Oliver Cowdery. This miracle that we assert to be true isn't something that we have to accept on the word of just a small handful of people. This is a well-documented event. In many court cases, all it takes is just two witnesses to convict somebody of a crime. Well, here I've counted well over 3,000 witnesses of the resurrected Lord. It's a very, very strong case for the resurrection of Christ. Statement number two. No one was resurrected before Jesus was resurrected. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. The answer is true. Verse 20 tells us that Jesus was the first fruits of them that slept. So as far as this world is concerned, Jesus was the first to be resurrected. Now, sometimes I'll have a student say, well, what about Lazarus? Wasn't he the first to be resurrected? And the answer is no. Lazarus was not resurrected. He was raised from the dead and brought back to his mortal body. But eventually, Lazarus died again. But to be resurrected is to be reunited with a perfect eternal body that will never die. So in that sense, Jesus was the first. Statement number three, everybody who has ever lived will be resurrected, whether good or bad. And go to verses 22 and 51. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Verse 51, behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So the answer is true. The key word is all. Everybody gets resurrected. We shall all be changed. This blessing is given to all that have kept their first estate or who didn't rebel in the pre-mortal world. So all mortals will be resurrected regardless of how they lived. Everyone from Mother Teresa to Osama bin Laden are going to be resurrected. From celestial beings to sons of perdition, Christ overcame death for all people. Statement number four, except for Jesus' resurrection, everybody will be resurrected at the same time. Verse 23, but every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. So the answer is false. Verse 23 tells us that everyone is resurrected in his own order. There's more than just one resurrection. Doctrinally speaking, I can think of at least five different resurrections. And here they are with scripture references for support. You've got the resurrection of celestial quality people at the time of Christ's resurrection. You can see that in Doctrine and Covenants 133, 54 through 55, and Matthew 27, verse 53. The resurrection of celestial quality people at the second coming. Doctrine and Covenants 88, verses 97 through 98. The resurrection of terrestrial quality people after the righteous are resurrected at the beginning of the millennium. Doctrine and Covenants 88, verse 99. The resurrection of those who led a telestial life at the end of the millennium. The resurrection of the unjust is what it's sometimes referred to. Doctrine and Covenants 88, verses 100 through 101. And then the resurrection of the sons of perdition after that telestial resurrection. Doctrine and Covenants 88, 102. Statement number five. Those that die without baptism have no hope for exaltation. 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? 
The answer is false. That's why we have baptism for the dead. Sometimes people of other faiths are surprised to see a biblical precedent for the practice of baptism for the dead. But, but here we have one clearly indicating that they did indeed do this in the early Christian church. I've sometimes wondered what other Christian faiths do with that verse. <laughs> How do they explain that one? And they, for the most part, accept that that's true, that they did do baptisms for the dead. I have a, a special Bible called the Oxford Study Bible. And in a footnote for verse 29, it says, Apparently, Christians underwent baptism vicariously for previously deceased loved ones to ensure their resurrection. And, and I do admit that that verse is a little hard to understand out of context. Remember the premise of the chapter. Paul is defending resurrection. So here he's saying, look, people, if there's no resurrection, then what's the use of these baptisms for the dead that we're doing if they rise not at all? Without resurrection, baptism for the dead is pointless. Why are they then baptized for the dead? But there is a resurrection, and therefore baptism for the dead makes sense. And this, this is a real faith builder for me personally. The only Christian faith that I know of that practices baptism for the dead is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This, this stands as another indicator to me that the church truly is the restored church that Jesus established in his day. And as a teacher, you may decide to spend a little bit more time on, on that idea, since this is the only verse in the Bible that specifically refers to baptism for the dead. So maybe just a few brief ideas if you decide to do that. You could take your students to Doctrine and Covenants 128 verse 17, where Joseph Smith says that baptism for the dead is the most glorious of all subjects belonging to the everlasting gospel. Well, I'd ask, why do you think he would say that? What, what is so glorious about that doctrine? What's glorious about baptism for the dead to you? Additionally, there's a great video on the history of baptism for the dead that you might consider showing. I'll provide a link to it in the video description below. Statement number six. There are different levels of resurrected bodies. Not all resurrected bodies are created equal. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 38 through 42. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. The answer is true. Paul is going to use three different metaphors to explain this principle. The metaphor of seeds, flesh, and astronomy. And each metaphor is basically making the same point. There are different kinds of seeds that grow into different plants. There are different kinds of flesh or types of creatures on the earth. You've got people and then beasts and fish and birds. And then you've got different levels of glory or brightness in the heavens, the glory of the sun and the moon and the stars, each one differing in the amount of glory or light that it produces. Now, as members of the church, we, we usually like to quote verses 40 through 42 as a support of our view of the final judgment and the three degrees of glory, which it certainly does. 
but it's not necessarily the context that Paul is speaking about here. He's focused on the resurrection part of the equation. The kind of resurrected bodies that individuals receive based on the judgment will be different in and of themselves. How different? A celestial body is as different from a terrestrial body as wheat is compared to a carrot, as a dog is compared to a seagull, or the light of the sun compared to the light of the moon. Not all resurrected bodies are created equal. They are different, very different. There are things that a celestial resurrected body can do that a telestial resurrected body cannot. Now, I know that begs the question, what are those differences? And we could speculate, but there just isn't much clear doctrine on that question. Just the fact that they are very different. Now, now there is at least one thing for certain that sets a celestial body apart from terrestrial and telestial bodies. And we can read about that in Doctrine and Covenants 131, verses 1 through 4 which tells us that a person cannot enter into the highest degree of the celestial kingdom without entering the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. And if not, he cannot have an increase. Increase in this sense means children. So a resurrected celestial body can have children, but no other kind can. I can also think of another difference, and that would be what members of the Godhead, those bodies, can stand in the presence of. A celestial resurrected body can abide the presence of God the Father, the Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. A terrestrial body can abide the presence of the Son and the Holy Ghost, but not the Father. And a telestial body can only abide in the presence of the Holy Ghost. And this is laid out in the following verses in Doctrine and Covenants 76. Verse 62, 77, 86, and 112. Now, other differences in those bodies? I don't know. I'm sure there are. But I, I don't really want to speculate uh, on what those might be. Statement number seven. A resurrected being is glorious and powerful. Verses 43 through 44. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. The answer is true. Our bodies will be amazing and glorious. And, and for fun, here are a few scriptures and quotes that give us an idea of that glory and power. What makes resurrection so wonderful? Alma 40, verse 23. The soul shall be restored to the body and the body to the soul. Yea, and every limb and joint shall be restored to its body. Yea, even a hair of the head shall not be lost, but all things shall be restored to their proper and perfect frame. So a, a resurrected body will be in its perfect form and proper frame. Now, what does that mean? I don't think it means that we're all going to look really, really different than we do now. I believe that we will continue to look like ourselves our facial features, our, our unique physical characteristics. But I imagine it will be us in a healthy state of being at the prime of our age. What's the prime of our age or, or our perfect frame? I don't know for sure, but, but I would imagine our, our 20s or 30s. But, but don't quote me on that. And of course, we won't carry the effects of any injuries, scars, sicknesses, deformities, or illnesses, whether physical or mental, that we've suffered during our mortal lives. 
we will be in our perfect form. I love this quote from Elder Jeffrey R. Hall. I bear witness of that day when loved ones whom we knew to have disabilities in mortality will stand before us glorified and grand, breathtakingly perfect in body and mind. What a thrilling moment that will be. I do not know whether we will be happier for ourselves that we have witnessed such a miracle or happier for them that they are fully perfect and finally free at last. And then this from Lorenzo Snow. In the next life, we will have our bodies glorified and free from sickness and death. Nothing is so beautiful as a person in a resurrected and glorified condition. There is nothing more lovely than to be in this condition and have our wives and children and friends with us. And one more from Brigham Young. I thought I'd add this in here. Something that he taught that a, a resurrected being has the ability to do. The brightness and glory of the next apartment is inexpressible. If we want to behold Jerusalem as it was in the days of the Savior, or if we want to see the Garden of Eden as it was when created, there we are, and we see it as it existed spiritually. For it was created first spiritually and then temporally, and spiritually it still remains. And when there we may behold the earth as at the dawn of creation, or we may visit any city we please that exists upon its surface. If we wish to understand how they are living here on these western islands, we are there. In fact, we are like the light of the morning. So, so kind of a cool idea of, of what we may be able to do as resurrected beings. And you might even consider sharing a few other abilities that a resurrected body apparently has or that have at least been demonstrated by those who have been resurrected. Resurrected people can eat. Luke 24, verses 42 through 43. Sometimes I have students that are really worried about that, uh, mostly teenage boys. Now, now, we won't necessarily need to eat to stay alive, but we can. So that's comforting. Jesus ate fish and honeycomb in front of the apostles after his resurrection. Resurrected people can appear or disappear from view. You can see that in Luke 24, 36. Uh, Jesus did it with his apostles. At one moment, he wasn't in the room with them, and then the next, he was. Resurrected people can fly or hover in the air, at least. There are many examples of the Savior ascending or descending from heaven. And then Moroni was standing above the young Joseph Smith in his room. You can see these examples in Joseph Smith History 1, 17 and verse 30, 3 Nephi 11, 8, and Acts 1, verse 9. That's just a few additional thoughts on what a resurrected body can do. Statement number 8. A resurrected body has blood in its veins. Verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So, false. This is a really interesting one. Paul saying that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And he's right, but flesh and bone can. Resurrected beings apparently have something else flowing through their veins. Blood is what makes us mortal. Joseph Smith had something to say about this. He said, Concerning resurrection, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, or the kingdom that God inherits or inhabits. But the flesh without the blood and the Spirit of God flowing in the veins instead of the blood, for blood is the part of the body that causes corruption. Therefore, we must be changed in the twinkle of an eye or have to lay down these tabernacles and leave the blood vanish away. Blood is the corruptible part of the tabernacle. Statement number nine. The process of an individual's resurrection will require many hours to complete. Let's go to verse 52. In a moment, 
in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So the answer is false. Verse 52 reveals that the process of resurrection happens in the twinkling of an eye or the blink of an eye. The change, apparently, is instantaneous. Well, I believe that with that activity, we've done a really good job of looking at the resurrection from a doctrinal standpoint. Hopefully, we've really touched the minds of our students at this point. Resurrection really is a fascinating and wonderful doctrine. But I'm not sure that we've really touched their hearts yet. And part of my philosophy of teaching is that in every lesson, we should strive to reach the head, the heart, and the funny bone. If we can reach all three, chances are that the lesson is going to be memorable and effective. So for the heart, you could try this activity. It's simple, but effective. You can just ask, how many of you have ever lost a loved one before? Or know of someone who has? It's going to be everybody. How do the following verses help or comfort you? Or how could they help somebody who has lost a loved one? Let them read those verses and just express their thoughts and feelings. Chapter 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Verses 25 through 26. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And then verses 54 through 57. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Personally, I really love that last one. This triumphant proclamation in verse 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? As tragic and difficult as death of a loved one is to accept and cope with, death will lose in the end. Jesus swallowed it up in his victory over it. Death will come to be seen as only a temporary separation from the ones that we love. I think that it's interesting that we all want to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Death is simply a transition from one state of existence to another. And the resurrection will remedy all of it. Truly, there is no tragedy in death. The only tragedy is in sin. So, to liken the scriptures, after all that we've talked about today, what do you look forward to most about the resurrection? For me, I can't wait for the resurrection. What a remarkable doctrine. You know what it most gives me? Hope. The doctrine of the resurrection is a doctrine of hope. I can't wait until the day when the pains and sicknesses and limitations of this mortal body will be gone. And I know that my problems are very small compared to many of yours. But but I get terrible migraines. I can't wait until the day when I don't have to deal with that anymore. My wife suffers from chronic back pain. What a wonderful thing it will be when that's no longer a problem for her. I think of a family in my ward who lost their little boy in a car accident. How they will see him again. What a reunion that will be. I think about my dear mother, who died of brain cancer, much too young. How I will get to see her again, and spend time with her, and laugh and talk, and rejoice in each other's company. And I could go on and on about 
many people in my life whose problems, challenges, and losses are going to be swallowed up in Christ's victory over death. Perhaps my favorite quote about the resurrection comes from Joseph Smith. Those who have died in Jesus Christ may expect to enter into all that fruition of joy when they come forth. Lay hold of these things and let not your knees or joints tremble, nor your hearts faint. And then what can earthquakes, wars, and tornadoes do? Nothing. All your losses will be made up to you in the resurrection, provided you continue faithful. By the vision of the Almighty, I have seen it. So is there such a thing as a panacea, a cure-all? Yes, it's called the resurrection. Let's make sure that that doctrine isn't missing from our list of beliefs. Well, like I said earlier, I would spend the majority of my time in chapter 15. But here are two quick thoughts from chapters 14 and 16. Chapter 14 addresses a problem that the Corinthians are having with the gift of tongues. And really probably would have gone better with last week's lesson on spiritual gifts. I'm not quite sure why they chose not to include it in last week's block of scriptures. But in Corinth, the gift of tongues apparently was the most desired gift to possess because it's the most showy or, or popular of the gifts. And this was the kind of speaking in tongues where you have somebody speaking a language that no other person could understand, which, which is a manifestation of that gift, but, but probably meant to be a fairly rare one. And more likely than not, they're desiring this gift for self-serving reasons, to draw attention to themselves. You know, hey, look at me. I'm so spiritual, I can speak in tongues. That, that's the context of this chapter. Read it with that in mind, and it will make much more sense to you. But the value of this chapter to us, in my mind, is in what Paul teaches us about the purpose of spiritual gifts within our church meetings. So for an icebreaker, something super simple. Hangman. Hey, why not? With the word being the word that best describes what the purpose of spiritual gifts is all about. We really want to highlight that word. And hangman is one way to, to do that. So what is the word? Edification. Edification. The purpose of spiritual gifts is to edify or build up the church and each other, not ourselves. Maybe you've sometimes heard uh, people refer to a building as an edifice. Well, that's a clue as to what that word means. It means to build others up into something beautiful and useful. Now go into chapter 14 and try to find as many verses as you can with some form of that word in them. Either edify, edifying, or edification. And then as a teacher, I might throw out a small treat to, to anyone who finds them. And they're going to find them in verses 3, 4, 5, 12, 17, and 26. So edification is what it's all about. God wants us to go to church so that we can edify each other. That's why Paul declares that the gift of prophecy is a greater gift than the gift of tongues, because people could actually understand what was being said. Just watching somebody else speak a language that nobody gets doesn't really help anybody much. It doesn't edify. So verses one through four, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. 
He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. And then this in verse 19. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. Do you see his message here? Yeah, speaking in unknown tongues is great and all that. But I'd much rather teach people something that they can understand. Speaking just five understandable words about the gospel is going to do so much more good than 10,000 words spoken in a language that nobody in the congregation can understand. Paul's point is clear. Edification is what matters most. That's the priority. So our truth, the purpose of our church meetings is to edify each other, not just ourselves. To liken the scriptures, how could this truth change the way we see and experience church meetings? And I believe that can make all the difference. It can change the very nature of the experience we have at church. Rather than going to church with a what's in it for me attitude, we can start asking, how can I bless others today? I remember a talk that Dallin H. Oaks gave years ago that really drove this principle home for me, kind of shifted my mindset. And in that talk, he said this, some say, I didn't learn anything today, or no one was friendly to me, or I was offended or the church is not filling my needs. All those answers are self-centered and all retard spiritual growth. In contrast, a wise friend wrote, Years ago, I changed my attitude about going to church. No longer do I go to church for my sake, but to think of others. I make a point of saying hello to people who sit alone, to welcome visitors, to volunteer for an assignment. In short, I go to church each week with the intent of being active, not passive, and making a positive difference in people's lives. Consequently, my attendance at church meetings is so much more enjoyable and fulfilling. All of this illustrates the eternal principle that we are happier and more fulfilled when we act and serve for what we give, not for what we get. Brilliant, right? What a wonderful attitude to have. That paradigm shift can fundamentally change our outlook and our experience of church attendance. If we go looking to bless others, then we probably will. If we go only looking for how others can bless us, it's very possible that we come away disappointed. So in conclusion, let's go to edify. Let's go to any church gathering with the intention of building others. And I'm sure that as we build, we're going to find that our testimonies, our faith, our love, and our happiness gets built as well. And now, one very brief thought from chapter 16. This is a concluding chapter with a number of personal farewells and some parting instructions from Paul. So, so not as much depth and relevance as other chapters in 1 Corinthians. But I do like verses 13 through 14. It's a good parting exhortation. And as a brief activity, you could ask what are some of the ways that members of your class might end a letter, an email, text message, phone call, or just saying goodbye to someone. Goodbye. Take care. See you soon. Farewell. All the best. Regards, ta-ta for now. Well, how about Paul here? Instead, he says goodbye with some faith-promoting appeals. He says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong, let all your things be done with charity. Or more easily stated, be on your guard, Stand firm in the faith, be men and women of courage, be strong in obedience, 
And make sure that whatever you do, do it in the spirit of love. So to liken the scriptures here, which one of Paul's exhortations there do you need most in your life? And what could you do this week to follow? It's a, it's a really good parting exhortation. Every single one of those phrases that he could. And that, my friends, is going to conclude our lesson this week. I know, a little bit shorter than usual. I really hope that something that I've shared today has helped you. And if it has, I, I encourage you to share this with somebody else that you feel it could help. As I always say, teachers, if you're interested in any of the resources that I create for teachers to help them to teach the scriptures, just go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to those resources. Thank you, everybody so much for spending this time with me. I hope that you'll join me again next week as we jump into 2 Corinthians. Now get out there and teach with power.